Okay, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, today we're very excited to have Jonas Buchli and Federico Felici with us uh, to talk about magnetic control of tokamak plasmas through deep reinforcement learning, where they replaced separate controllers with a single policy using reinforcement learning that is able to control a diverse set of plasma configurations. So a little bit about our speakers today. Uh, Jonas is a senior research scientist at DeepMind, and he has been working at the intersection of machine learning and control for most of his career, as well as a wide range of interdisciplinary topics. And Federico is a research scientist at the Swiss Plasma Center at EPFL, where he leads the research activities in advanced plasma control and future fusion devices. So I'm very excited about today's topic. We will have questions and discussions at the end of the talk. So without further ado, let's start our seminar. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's my great, great uh, ple pleasure to to give the, the first part of this uh, talk, and my colleague uh, Jonas Bukli will take the, the still take the se second pa part. Uh, first of all, let me say that it's really a pleasure to give this talk on behalf of this big uh, team consisting of people both from EPFL, Swiss Plasma Center, which is the place where I work, which is uh, a center for research on plasma physics for fusion in particular. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the DeepMind team, where all of the experience and the expertise with the machine learning, reinforcement learning in particular, uh, came, came from. So without further ado, let's begin the story by, first of all, uh, introducing you to what is nuclear fusion and what are we trying to do and what are to tokamaks. Now, uh, if, um, I'll give a very brief introduction because, of course, covering the topic exhaustively would take much more time than we have today. But basically, the idea is that we are trying to achieve thermonuclear fusion on Earth with the goal of, uh, in the future, be able to use it for electricity production. And the problem with nuclear fusion is that while it has many advantages from the energy generation point of view, it's quite complicated to achieve on Earth because you need a high temperature, uh, a high density, and a long confinement time. And when you're at these kind of temperatures, in particular, the, uh, the, the ma matter you're trying to fuse is in the so-called plasma state, which means that the ions and the electrons are dissociated and they're flying around, uh, around freely and forming this complicated material, which we call uh, plasma, which behaves in very complicated ways, but can also be influenced by electromagnetic fields. And the main idea, of magnetic confinement fusion is to use magnetic fields to confine this hot high temperature plasma and keep it far away from the walls of your fusion uh, of your fusion reactor that you are trying to make on earth uh, from which you're trying to extract and to generate electricity in the end. So typically we're talking about temperatures of more than 100 million Kelvin, uh, uh, relatively low densities compared to, for example, atmospheric densities of uh, typically uh, 10 to the power 20 particles per meter cube. Uh, and we're talking about confinement time. So the amount of time that you keep these, uh, um, the, the heat and the in, inside the heat and the particles confined inside the plasma of the order of one second. One particular way to do magnetic control, there are many different ways of, of achieving this. One particular way is a so-called tokamak configuration, which is when the magnetic fields are arranged in an axisymmetric or in a toroidal uh, uh, sh shape, um, which look kind of like like this. So this is an example of a picture from the actually the the biggest existing operating tokamak, which is in in Oxford, pretty close to where uh, you are. It's a European tokamak um, where you see here an example of on the left what the inside of the tokamak looks like when they are not making pla plasmas, and on the right you see what the actual Pla plasma itself looks like. And it's interesting to see that the actual core of the plasma, which is the hot part, which is around 100 million degrees, you cannot uh, actually see because it's so hot, it's not emitting any lights in the visible radiation spe spectrum. Now, uh, that was one example of a tokamak. There's also a tokamak, a smaller tokamak at the called TCV at the Swiss Plasma Center at the campus of EPFL in uh, in Swiss, Switzerland, uh, 
uh, we see some pictures of it here and um, if you look then at what the tokamak looks like actually on the inside uh, when you were when we're doing our plasma experiment it looks like this so you can see this beautiful plasma with these beautiful uh, purple co colors here um, now looking again from the outside of the tokamak it looks like this you see there's a lot of sorts of uh, all sorts of equi equipment also around it to take complicated measurements of the plasma or also to try to heat the plasma to increase the temperature but if we remove all of that and we focus on the mag magnetic coils used to generate the magnetic fields to confine the pla plasma and we have something like this we can see a combination of magnetic field coils and if we uh, remove the external coils and we look a bit in more detail of how the, the the whole magnetic field structure looks you can see that on the inside you have a representation of the actual plasma and that's surrounded by this gray part which is the so-called vacuum vessel which uh, yeah which is uh, used to remove you know to keep have a, a vacuum within which the the plasma can then be created to separate it from the outside atmosphere then around that are these red coils which are the so-called poloidal field coils which are used for actual control of the, where we want the uh, where we want our pla plasma to be and then these outside bigger coils which are shown in yellow are the so-called toroidal field coils and i'll explain in a minute what how all these magnetic fields interact and how they are used to generate the magnetic field that confines the plasma so let's look in a bit more detail at this magnetic field st structure so to have a successful confinement of this uh, of this very hot plasma meaning confining it keeping it away from the uh, from the outside wall of the reactor you basically need a superposition of two different kinds of magnetic fields so i'm showing in this picture how these are generated the first one is generated by this big coil this yellow coil called the toroidal field coil it's called that light because the current goes around like this, which means that a toroidal magnetic field is generated going around uh, the plasma in this toroidal direction. Now, unfortunately, that's not sufficient to actually confine the particles of the plasma, but to have sufficient confinement, you need actually also to have a field in this direction, which we call the poloidal direction. And that's actually generated by an electrical current running inside the plasma. So the combination of the current in the external coil, which makes the field like that in the toroidal direction and the toroidal current in the plasma, which makes the field in the poloidal direction, make these kind of helical uh, magnetic field lines, which are successfully able to confine the uh, plasma and keep it at high temperature um, for some reasonable confinement time. Now, once you ha have, have this, this by itself is not enough, you also need the external coils, which I was showing earlier, the so-called control coils, to make sure that the plasma is maintained in the position that you actually want. So I'll show this in a bit more detail here. Here's now, again, the tokamak, but now showing only these poloidal field coils, so the coils that are used for the plasma control. And the, in this case, we're showing again the TCB tokamak that we have at EPFL in Switzerland, where there are many of such control coils. And they allow quite a lot of flexibility in how to actually position and control um, our tokamak plasma. Now, the reason we're interested in actually controlling the position and the and the sh shape is that this position and shape of the plasma has a very important effect on the quality of the confinement. So the kind of temperatures you can reach and the kind of pressures you can reach. And this is very important because the higher the temperature and the higher the pressure, the more fusion reactions we're going to ha 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 have. Now, I want to clarify at this point that in the TCV, um, uh, the TCV tokamak is a, a reactor which we use for research. So we don't generate significant amount of fusion reactions, and we're using it mostly to study and to understand how the plasma behaves under the influence of magnetic fields and various heating systems. Um, however, there are other tokamaks which do uh, um, attempt to generate fusion energy. For example, the jet tokamak I was showing earlier, in Oxford, quite recently, you might have heard uh, established the world uh, fusion energy record, breaking the record of how much energy was actually generated in terms of fusion reactions during one, one single experiment. And all of this research, um, again, is going towards uh, producing electricity in the, in the future. So all these tokamaks are a ste stepping stone towards 
larger and more performant reactors, which we will build and which we are building now, which will operate in the future, which will push us more towards a regime where more fusion energy is being created by the fusion reactions with respect to the power we have to put in to drive the magnetic fields and to heat the actual plasma. Now, coming back to a bit more of the details of how this plasma shape actually looks and what we're trying to control, there's a number of things which we uh, care about uh, controlling. Again, using the magnetic field coils, which are on the outside, we can influence in detail how the plasma looks and where it is inside the vacuum, vacuum vessel. So we care about the actual position. In this case, the position represented by the center of the plasma is here, but we might want to move it up or down for whatever reason to uh, study the plasma in different, different way, way, ways. Another important aspect we might want to control is the location of the so-called last close flux surface, which is this black surface going around here, which is kind of the, uh, the surface which defines the boundary between the part which is hot and confined and the part on the outside where some of the plasma that escapes inter interacts with the wall material, for example. And we also want to control how this looks. In particular, we are often interested in controlling how this location of this so-called X po point. So you see this point here. This is a point, a so-called magnetic null. And this means that the field in the poroidal direction here is equal to zero, and there's purely a field in the toroidal direction. And all these things can, again, be influenced by our poroidal field coils, our control coils over here. So these carry an electrical cu current, and um, they basically control where this plasma is and what kind of shape this last closed flux surface is going to have and where these strike points are going to be. Strike points are also important because they are the location where, in the end, the plasma that exits from, uh, from the last closed flux surface kind of follows these magnetic field lines and can end up over here and interact with the material of the wall. Now, to be able to get the plasma that we're uh, looking for, that we desire, we need to actually control the currents in these poloidal field coils, in these control coils, in real time. This is typically done by a, a controller, by a feedback controller, or actually using a combination of feed forward and feedback control that I'll, I'll explain later in more, in more de detail. But for now, let's just realize that this means taking on the order of 100 magnetic me measurements. So measuring 100, uh, taking 100 measurements of magnetic fields and of um, magnetic fl fluxes and other quantities which we need sending it to a controller, which typically in the case of TCV operates at 10 kilohertz, so 10,000 times per second. And then this sends 19 um, commands to the 19 control coils in terms of the voltages that the power supplies are supposed to apply to these coils to influence their current and to steer the plasma ultimately where we want. Now let's think a bit more in detail about what we need to control. So there's a number of key parameters we need to control. The first one being just simply the total value of the, to of the toroidal plasma current. If you remember, a part of the magnetic field, the poloidal magnetic field, was generated by, the, uh, by this pla plasma current. And this has to be induced through these, control, uh, through these control coils by a transformer effect. The other things we want to control are, in particular, the radial and the vertical position, so where the plasma is in our vacuum vessel. And these three, the total plasma current, the radial and the vertical position together, are the basic things which you need to control in every to tokamak. Just to be able to have a well-controlled plasma, you need to control these three. And then, as I mentioned, you might, want be, might be interested in controlling the actual plasma shape, meaning the distribution of the last close flux surface and where it is. There's a further complication in terms of the vertical position control in particular, is that actually uh, most of the plasmas we're interested in are actually unstable in the vertical direction. This means usually we want to study plasmas for various reasons that I can't discuss today, but for various reasons, we want to control plasmas which have a so-called positive, uh, which have an elongation so-called higher than one, which means that they're higher in this direction than they are wide in the radial direction, kind of like the one I'm showing here. And for these plasmas, it turns out that they are unstable in their position, meaning that if you only control the um, electrical currents in the control coils and don't look at what the plasma is doing, um, the plasma will actually be unstable and will go like in this uh, illustration here, will fly up into the wall and interact with the 
wall, which means the plasma will cool down and lose its energy, and we're not going to have any uh, fusion reactions any, anymore. So this is, of course, what we want to avoid, which is why we need to actually feedback control the vertical position to uh, suppress this instability in the first place, while at the same time taking care of all these other control problems as well. So now I'll spend a few minutes describing how these kind of control problems are solved using traditional engineering te te techniques. So since all tokamaks need this kind of control, there's been a lot of effort in the past uh, to achieve magnetic control of tokamaks using existing control engineering techniques. And typically what we do is we so solve uh, a, a set of, of equations describing the evolution of our system, and we use that to pre-compute the coil currents that we want to have in the control coils, and compute the voltages that we need to apply to these coil to these coils to achieve the coil currents that we want. So this takes care of the feed-forward part, so the preparation of uh, how we're going to make uh, plasma during a given plasma experiment. Then, as I said, that's not enough because you also need to control the system in feedback for the suppressing the vertical instability, but also uh, just to make sure that any, any, uh, any, um, any small mistakes you might have made in the feed forward calculations, because the model you use for that is, not, uh, is often not 100% perfect, you need to compensate for these using feedback control. So then there is a process of designing uh, observers and controllers. So observers meaning you need to somehow from the magnetic measurements that you have, find out what is the uh, what are the quantities you, what is the value of the quantities you want to control so what is the radial position the vertical position and the plasma current and you need to solve a relatively complicated non-linear partial differential equation in real time to find out what the plasma shape actually is so what the distribution is of the plasma where the last close flux surface is so then you have the observers you have actual an estimate of the quantities you want to control and then you need to actually design controllers to control each of these. Now, the first step of that is to choose a combination of colloidal field coils, so a combination of the control coils, these coils labeled A, B, C, uh, D, E, and F, a combination of these coils, like a few coils here and a few coils there to control a given quantity that you, that you want to control. And then once you've chosen the, the actuators you want to use, you design individual independent, usually single input, single output controllers, for each of these quantities. So you design one controller for the radial position, another for the vertical position, another for the plasma current, and another for the plasma shape. And you need to be careful to make sure that there's no interaction or you minimize the interaction between all of, all of these. Now, I should say this approach has been, has been successful in the sense that many tokamaks worldwide operate using controllers designed more or less along the lines that I have described here. And they're relatively successful in that we can make all sorts of varieties of different, different shapes and run tokamak experiments to study and understand the behavior of the plasmas under the influence of magnetic fields, but also of other things like how we heat the plasma and how we fuel the, 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 how we fuel the, the pla, 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 plasma and do all sorts of detailed studies to, to understand how tokamaks work and how plasma confinement in tokamaks work. But still, I hope I've convinced you that these controllers, though they are effective, they are also quite complicated to tune because of the number of kind of manual decisions or partly manual decisions that the control engineer has to take to do this design. So this really requires a lot of control engineering expertise and a lot of understanding of how the different control um, actuators affect how the plasma actually, uh, actually, be, actually behaves. And it is the job of the tokamak control engineers to do this, and depending on what kind of shapes you're trying to control or how well you want to control to perform, this can be a relatively complicated job. So what we wanted to do in the work that we are describing, um, that we are describing today, is to try a completely different approach of controlling, uh, controlling plasmas in a tokamak using the magnetic fields. So the idea is that we want to try to substitute entirely the conventional control, which as I described has all these different components, by a completely different architecture, where we substitute all these components by just one single control policy. And we try to generate the entire control policy in one 
one go. So without designing the separate controllers, try to solve the problem at the same time of controlling all of these quantities. And at that point, we will be able to specify directly the kind of targets that we want. So what, how we want our plasma to behave and how we want our plasma to look. And then ideally we would be able to obtain one single control policy, which does everything that we want without having to design the components separately, without having to do a separate feed forward generation and without having to do a separate estimation prior step of estimating the, uh, uh, the, the errors in the variables that we want to control, trying to do everything at the same time. At this point, I will hand it over to uh, Jonas Buchli, who will explain how we solve this problem using reinforcement learning. Great. Thanks, Federico. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's look a little bit how what reinforcement learning is and how it helped us basically achieving this goal that Federico has uh, set out. So um, many of you in the crowd basically probably have heard about uh, various forms of machine learning. There is this, this very different flavors. One is supervised learning, where sort of it's a you solve a static um, mapping problem, you predict an output from um, input given examples, or there's unsupervised learning, for example, uh, clustering algorithms where you try to find patterns from a data set. Now, reinforcement learning is quite a bit different. Um, it's, it has to do with dynamic systems and dynamics of decision making. And in a nutshell, it's literally the formalization of uh, trial and error learning. So just a little, quite a bit how humans we learn it actually has been inspired quite a bit from, um, you know, from uh, psychology, um, but it has a very uh, strong mathematical underpinning. So you basically, what you do, right? So you, you would uh, um, sort of explore and gather experience and then learn from this experience how to do a certain task better. And we often sort of formalize this with this like little um, action, you know, um, observation loop that you see down here where an agent um, um, interacts with an environment and there's a reward. So we will talk more about that um, uh, through the reminder of the talk. So, but maybe briefly, so what, what are the advantages of reinforcement learning? Um, why would you want to put up with like the complexity that these learning algorithms bring? Well, first of all, it makes very few assumptions. So you can learn to control nonlinear stochastic dynamical systems in principle. You can handle like heterogeneous and very large observation spaces so combining time series and images, for example, um, on different time scales. Uh, you can have it very heterogeneous action spaces and you sort of have like one way to tell the agent or the, the algorithm what you want to do, that's this reward function. And so it's the one and only way to define your, your control objective. So what a good reward is, and this allows for a large flexibility. However, it also means that in these reward functions, you really have to define all the specifics that define a good solution. And it turns out that this can be a little bit of a tricky thing. So humans are not very good actually in transferring what they know is a good solution into this kind of like um, scalar value, which is a reward function. We will talk a little bit more about that. Um, but many of you might have seen, right? I mean, the last decade, there were like very big successes of, um, of uh, RL in machine learning. So um, here at DeepMind, the work on, on, you know, solving sort of like many different, really, really difficult board games like Shogi and Go and chess. Um, with single algorithms by now, or, or the, the, the very complex um, online game of StarCraft. But then also in the, real, in, in the real world, right? There's successes are here in the middle. Just one example from our friends at OpenAI, where they sort of solved um, Rubik's Cube solving with a real robot. Um, but maybe let's, let's just quickly look a little bit what is a big difference between um, games and the real world when you're when it comes to like controlling and, and doing reinforcement learning. So in, in games, you have discrete states and actions. It might be a very large, but it's always a finite choice of actions that you have. Typically, it's actually fairly small even. And you can have um, a very large, and, but it's always a finite state space. And also very importantly, the simulations, which are the game engines, are perfect. They're perfect representations of the physics of the thing you really care about. Whereas in, in real world problems, in particular when it comes to things like plasma physics, um, that's not true, right? So the, the states and the actions of the system are, I mean, depending how you want to look at it, but you could say they're an infinite um, choice of actions. There's an infinite state space. Um, and no matter how you slice it, it's going to be like even larger than on the left side. And very importantly, also the simulations will always be approximations to the reality and very crude ones on top of that, right? So basically, I mean, 
there's a lot of physicists in the in the audience, obviously, and you know what what it takes, right? You slice away a lot of the complexity in order to basically uh, come up with models of the world, and that's what basically is the basics of simulations. Here's another um, tricky business with reinforcement learning. So this is best illustrated with this little critter that learns to try to run over really difficult terrains. And here you see basically um, how many trials and what the sort of outcome is. And this is just a sort of a 2D problem, if you will, with, with you know, a few degrees of freedom. Um, after 200 trials, that's barely, I mean, it cannot even stand yet. After 2000 trials, it you know, sort of knows that maybe how to get forward, but it doesn't get very far. Um, after 6,000 trials, you started to see some sophisticated behavior, but it still, it still doesn't get very far. And you have to get all the way to basically 15,000 trials before that creator really learned um, proficiently to get over that terrain. And this just sort of highlights that um, reinforcement learning is very data hungry. So you have to usually have a lot of data, a lot of trials, a lot of experience that you gather from your environment in order to find the good solutions. So let's look a little bit how these different components look like in this action environment loop, um, what this then basically means, um, what we have seen. So um, what is an environment? Well, the environment is sort of the, the stand-in for your world, or uh, control engineers would sometimes call it a plant, um, where you basically you put the actions in, and then you can observe what is going on. You have some measurements, and there's also a reward being generated somewhere. Um, we can discuss if that should be exactly the environment. or But there is a there's an oracle that based on what happens in the world gives you a reward attached to it. In our case, uh, the environment is the TCV tokamak. So basically, whereas Federico said, there's 19 control actions. Um, and we use uh, nine, 92 observations, which are mostly magnetic um, uh, observations of flux loops, magnetic probes, and then also the coil currents um, in the control coils. And we can compute that reward that we talk about. Now, this is not a directly useful environment to learn directly against for the reason that well, first of all, it's an unstable system, as Federico pointed out. So, um, and you know, you don't want to just start from ground zero and mess around with it. And then, more importantly, I would say here on that specific tokamak, the discharges are short, so they last about two seconds, and you only get like an experiment maximally about every ten to fifteen minutes. <clears throat> and it's a shared facility, so there's actually a lot of people from around the world that want to use this facility. So reasonably, you can only get a handful of experiments, and that's just not enough. I mean, it's far away from that, those 15,000, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of experiments that you typically would want to have. So the solution usually that you can use um, to, for this is basically train your solution against a, sim um, a simulator. So you have a stand-in, um, as we said before. But again, so these are models. Um, and what we're using is the FG simulator, which has been developed at EPFL. Um, it's a free boundary Gratia Fraunhoff solver and has, it's augmented with circuit equations uh, for the conductors. But in addition, we had to augment the, and this um, basic uh, plasma physics uh, model a little bit more. So we had to um, add a little bit of a model for the power supplies. That's mostly to do with the delays, but a little bit also with offsets. Um, and just as a take home message, the simulated environment has to expose the relevant dynamics to the reinforcement learning algorithms for your control problem. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to sort of have the relevant dynamics. And again, as control engineers in the audience might understand, for example, delays are an important one. Um, if you forget about those, the solutions will not transfer. So what happens if, if you miss an important um, element, your solutions will not transfer onto the real plant. Um, okay, then what do we, what we did we try to achieve? So basically, sort of in, a, in an increasing order of difficulties, it was a little bit like how we went also through the experimental schedule. So first goal is basically just want to keep the plasma alive. And you can sort of, as Federico said, right on um, the uh, plasma is unstable. So if you don't do it well, it's sort of here, it goes vertically down. You lose it after like only like 24 milliseconds. And then, oops, that's one too much. If you um, learn how to control here on the right side, um, you can keep it alive for, you know, 550 milliseconds, which was at the time the full control window we had. But you, you see it sort of wobbling around a little bit. So that's not, it's not exactly a beautiful solution yet. So then. The next step is basically tell the plasma where should it be. So stabilize basically the sort of the um, you know the center of the uh, where that center is, and you can teach that to the algorithm, saying, well, you know, don't worry so much about the shape. Just make sure that the plasma is in a in a certain place. 
And then the uh, reinforcement learning algorithm will actually find sort of like a really small round plasma, which as we have been told by our uh, friends at, at uh, uh, Infusion, right, that this is a nice and stable solution. So the algorithm sort of exploits the inherent stability, but this is sort of not the, the shape that you necessarily want, right? As Federico indicated, there's other shapes you might want to have. You want to have a bigger, you want to have a bigger volume that they have more energy in the plasma. So, and ultimately there's many other things. So this is the, the figure that Federico wanted uh, indicated before. So you might want to care about any of these things and tell the algorithm via the reward functions, where should that flux boundary be? Where should um, sort of basically X points be? Um, should they be active or passive? Where should the legs be, right? Because that's important for um, energy deposition and so on. And then you wanna typically have this with some precision. So in our work, we sort of set ourselves a requirement of about two centimeters for shape parameters and IP to within five kiloamps, which is a realistic uh, quantity as we have been told. And they can all be time varying quantities. So we sort of tell over time where the different quantities should be. Now, <clears throat> what is the agent um, that is uh, working against and is supposed to learn this? So that's sort of the, the mirror to the environment. So it's a thing that takes the observations and the reward and produces actions that's supposed to solve uh, the task. And in particular to um, make it a bit more formal, we wanna find an optimal policy, which basically in our case, and typically in reinforcement learning maximize a discounted or an expected discounted sum of future rewards. Um, sort of to drive that point home a little bit more in more detail. So you're, you're, you're getting a reward and so you can compute something that's called a, a state action value function, which is really the expectation of that, um, that sum, that future sum or discounted sum of your rewards. And it's a function of the state you're in and the action. And in a nutshell, what it is, it sort of tells you if I'm in a given state and for the, all the actions I can take and then follow the actions of the given policy pi here, what would be uh, the reward that I would get? Um, and now, that is, if you think about it, in a, in a, in a case like the, the tokamak um, with this like really large state space, it's a, it's a huge mathematical, very complex mathematical function. So it's not something you can just enumerate. That's exactly where neural networks come in. So we represent that with a neural network. Um, for smaller problems, you can sometimes get away with like sort of doing table-based or even explicit approaches, but that's totally out of the question for this physics problem that we're looking at. Then there's different flavors of RL um, and sort of, Two important ones are the value-based methods. So where basically you, you literally sort of learn these Q functions by having a, a candidate um, uh, like policy, use that to uh, gather experience, then use this to improve, learn the Q function sort of in iterative fashion, um, converge towards an optimal Q function and an optimal policy. And there is sort of like, re you can reason through that this uh, procedure should, should uh, converge. So this is not um, totally just like guesswork. Um, then there's like another important family which we haven't used here, policy-based methods, so where you don't basically try to approximate the Q function, but you directly work with the policies and you roll them out and you sort of directly find the gradient for the policies or the parameters of that policy. Um, and they can also be very useful depending on the circumstances. But what we used is a value-based function, so more specifically an actor-critic method, so where the critic learns the Q functions from the data that is generated by the actors um, with the environment, and then the actor basically learns a policy by optimizing against that learned function. Right? I explicitly say here, but again, what it is, right? It's Q of state and action. So now what the policy needs to do is in a given state, what is the action that I should take so that I get the maximum Q? And then you can do this, if you can do this for any state, then basically have an optimal policy. And um, as I said before, so deep informal learning basically means that we're using sort of deep, more or less deep neural networks for the Q functions and for the policy. And other than that, um, it's very close to uh, quantities that we also see in optimal control. Um, then very importantly, the actor critic method has an advantage. It allows for the asymmetry. So the networks that are in the critic can be very big because they learn against the simulator in the data center. They don't have to run on the real plant. However, the policy has to run in hard real time at 10 kilohertz on the, on the real plant. And so basically with these methods, we can really basically have a very big critique and a small and very fast um, policy for inference. Um, we use, first for, for the algorithm to train that, we use um, MPO, which is sort of a trust region-based formulation of, our, of the actor critic method, um, which adds stability to the learning 
it's a, a fairly data efficient method, which is important because you have to be able to deal with varying degrees of off-policiness. Um, uh, and, and basically this algorithm is very good at that. And it's sort of battle tested for continuous action, state action space. And as I sort of indicated, right, discretizing physical systems like the tokamaks are, are is difficult. This is not usually, this gives you a combinatorial explosion. That's not usually what you want to do. So you need a method that works with continuous state action spaces. We then basically, so when we learn, we have what, we, what is called a learning loop. So we, we create typically many, many instances of the environment, uh, which interact with a, a, a candidate policy. We store this, um, the, the outcome of this in a, in a, on a data server, then the learning algorithm can pull down, um, basically use this to improve, the, uh, learn the Q function, fit the policy, and then um, periodically this gets deployed into the policies. And so actually the data service indicated here with the replay buffer. And then it just basically, you know, you iterate over this procedure. Once this has sufficiently converged, um, you take an instance of the control policy, and then we have a, a basically a deployment pipeline that generates from the TensorFlow graph, a hard real time capable binary that we can then hand over to the people that run uh, the operations at the Tokamak and run this in hard real time um, on the plant. Um, how are we doing in time? Good, okay. So maybe just a, a quick word about the importance of the asymmetry, asymmetry in, the, in the message, right? So we, we looked at this a little bit and um, it turns out that this is critical. I mean, you can even make a very big uh, feed-forward network. Um, it turns out that recurrence actually helps, and this makes sense, right? Because it gives memory um, in the process, which the physics also has. We sort of also looked, I mean, you know, how many actors do you need? We typically train with 5,000 actors, um, but for many problems, you can get away with, with a bit less. Um, there's sort of a an asymptotic, and, but it also is very much dependent on the difficulty of the problem you're trying to solve. Um, but this is also, I think, not a finished exploration. I think we are convinced that in the, in the mid long term, we can bring this down to much less actors, actually to a point where people can run this on a fairly beefy machine, desktop machine, and don't need a data center uh, to run all of that. Um, we then transferred uh, our simulation agents to the Tokamak. So um, the deployment actually, to our positive surprise, mostly just worked. There was a, a number of small environment variations that we had to introduce to robustify a little bit, which had to do with the measurement noise, some of the plasma parameters we had to um, randomize a little bit, and the power supply actually models some of the elements turned out to be a little critical, um, mostly the delays, but a few other things as well, like offsets. Um, yeah, and then we basically iterated with our colleagues at SPC um, to uh, improve over the reward function to improve the performance and then also did some simulator upgrades. Good. I hand back to um, Federico who will uh, talk us through the results that we were able to achieve. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonas. Yes. So I'll show you some of the results beginning from the one you're seeing, uh, you're seeing right here, which is an example of one of the reinforcement learning control experiments that we did. This was one that we did to actually demonstrate all the different, the ability of the reinforcement learning algorithms to do a number of different things from the plasma control point of view. So you see that as a function of, of, uh, of, as a function of time at the beginning of this experiment, the plasma was created in a certain position, kind of high up in the vessel, and then it was moved actively down to a lower position. And then this X point was created with the so-called legs, as I explained earlier. And so we, we actually prescribe what we want the plasma to do. That's shown with the little blue dots there. And then the controller was trained, as um, Jonas explained, and then deployed on the actual tokamak. And what you're seeing here is not a simulation. It's actually a result of a feedback controlled experiment with the machine learning trained controller for the plasma acting on our uh, TCB tokamak and controlling the uh, feedback control, uh, con the feedback control co coils. This is just one example, and I'm showing it here in a little bit more detail. So you see the time evolution from left to right at the beginning with this relatively small plasma and then the formation of the X points and then bringing it back to the original position. And you see at the bottom, you see the actual time traces of the references that we prescribed as to what we wanted the plasma to do, what we wanted the various parameters of the shape to do, and then uh, overlaid what, what it actually did. And we see the match here is pretty, pretty good. 
Um, and that was not that was just one demonstration discharge. And then we actually tried to use the same approach to uh, create many different configurations. So many different plasma shapes, many different shapes of the last closed flux surface. We see one case with a relatively high elongation shown here. One case again with an X point and a high elongation. This is a shape which is similar to the one which is planned for the future document called ITER. Uh, which is actually being being uh, being uh, also studied at TCV, and here is an example of a plasma with a slightly different shape, which is so-called negative triangularity. So, if you want, with respect to this one, it's uh, like a D shape but flipped in the opposite direction. These are also topic of very active study for a number of reasons to assess their whether they are viable and interesting for future fusion reactors. And here is another example where instead of having one X point, we have two X points which is interesting from the point of view of how the plasma interacts with the surrounding material, with the surrounding wall, uh, when the plasma particles exit from the last closed flux surface. So again, this was all trained using exactly the same reinforcement learning procedure, just by changing the details of the reward fu function. So how we reward the various degrees of achievement of the target shape, and um, yeah, and then running the same uh, reinforcement learning procedure, interacting with the with the simulator environment, and then deploying it onto the actual tokamak. So all of these were actual experiments uh, done on the TCV tokamak. Uh, then we actually moved on to do something which we had never done on TCV before, which is to actually make and maintain two plasmas completely separately in the va vacuum va vessel. This is interesting for a, a no, number of different reasons. In particular, we're interested at TCV in studying in detail what happens when these two plasmas are being slowly merged. Um, but in this case, we managed for the first time to actually stabilize two completely separate plasmas in the vacuum vessel, as you see in the camera image here as well. And what's interesting here is because these two currents, these two plasmas have currents which are going in the toroidal direction, in the same direction, they naturally tend to attract. So it's naturally an unstable system for that reason as well. So you need to carefully control the magnetic fields to actually keep these plasmas separated from each other. And the reinforcement learning trained agent was able to do this successfully, not only to stabilize them, but also to ramp up the current in both of these um, kind of droplet plasmas individually and maintain both of them at the desired position as we show here. Now, having shown these um, these these uh, these these results and having demonstrated that this reinforcement learning approach works for magnetic control of tokamak of to tokamak pla plasmas, we also uh, took a step back and thought: so, what did we actually learn, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of using a reinforcement learning based approach to control for magnetic control of plasmas with respect to the traditional um, control engineering techniques, which we can classify as multi-input, multi-output. PID controller like te techniques. Now, as I said at the beginning, one, um, one issue with the um, traditional methods is that you have to have an explicit step before where you compute the estimators for the quantities that you want to actually control. While in a reinforcement learning implementation, the whole problem of estimation of the control variables and the feedback control is handled all in one step, all based on the single reward fu fu function. That, that simplifies that aspect. Also, in the traditional controllers, you need, um, yeah, you need to, first of all, again, uh, have these separate state estimators, some of them which, of which are very complex, like the re uh, equilibrium reconstruction, and you need to tune all of these control, all of these control loops independently. So it's quite a large number of control parameters you need to tune, typically in the order of about 10 to 20 parameters, which you need to tune, for which you need the control engineering expertise to figure out which parameters to change when something doesn't behave the way you, um, you expect it. And again, in the reinforcement learning solution, you have the joint solution to the entire stabilization and control problem in one go. Now, again, for the traditional controllers, you need the engineer control engineering expertise to design the controllers. In the reinforcement learning implementation, you still need a lot of domain no no knowledge, but the domain knowledge goes mostly into the generation of the simulator and of the environment in which the reinforcement learning agent is to be trained. Um, 
And so that also requires a lot of expertise and a lot of work in physical modeling, in plasma physics and physics understanding of the system you want to control. But once you have that, you are done and you don't need the separate step of the consider control engineering oriented expertise. Um, as I mentioned again, in the traditional controllers, uh, you need to tune several different control uh, control parameters, having a kind of an idea of which parameter changes which aspect of the control. In the reinforcement learning implementation, you also have to do tuning, but that's mostly on the side of the reward function engineering. So you have to weigh in some way, you have to weigh the different things which go into the reward function, for example, weigh the accuracy of the X point position control versus the accuracy of the uh, last close flux surface um, distribution control. Uh, so you also you need to tune things in both cases, but you're tuning slightly different different th th things. Now, this being said, there are some things which are uh, which which I would say are still an advantage in the more traditional um, ways of doing control. One of them is indeed this very clear relation between the parameters and various aspects of the control performance. There's usually a clear relationship between changing one of the parameters in the controllers and what effect this is expected to have on the actual closed loop dynamics of the controlled system. Uh, and if something goes wrong and if the system is not behaving the way you expect, you usually know what to change and what to do. But with the reinforcement learning implementation, what you get out of the reinforcement learning procedure is just a kind of a, a black, black box controller, uh, which you cannot really change in an easy way. So indeed, one of the future avenues of, of um, where we want to go with future studies is to also be able to have uh, tunable controllers coming out of these kind of reinforcement learning approaches. Another issue which we encountered in this particular implementation of the reinforcement learning control is that there is fundamentally no guarantee that any of the controlled variables will actually go to a zero steady state error. So for example, whether the plasma position will exactly be what you ask it to be, you know, within the measurement accuracy. Uh, and that's fundamentally because the, 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 the agent which was trained was a feed forward only, um, feed forward only a, a agent. So in traditional controllers, we have something called an integral effect when you have integral controllers, which integrate the control error. And therefore uh, you can show that when these controllers work the way they should, some control variables actually go exactly to zero in steady state. And that's quite a, a big advantage from the control performance point of view. And it's also something which would be very interesting to introduce in reinforcement learning approaches as well. So this brings me to the outlook of, of, this, of this work. So I already mentioned a few ways in which the reinforcement learning control implementations can be improved based on the, on the work we did so far. So again, using recurrent policies, so introducing dynamics into the actor network to get zero steady state uh, errors or other desirable uh, dynamic control behavior. Introduce tunable parameters, as I mentioned, the way by which you can affect the behavior of your the controller after the trade training phase. And also, uh, as mentioned, the policies or the agents that we the, used in this work relied 100% on training on the simulator. And it didn't use the feedback of experimental data to improve the models or improve the agents in any way. And that's something which, of course, would also be very interesting to try to somehow um, combine this approach with improving the model by experimental data. Also, a future step for using reinforcement learning in fusion science in particular is to try to use it to actually optimize plasma performance, meaning ultimately fusion power, by controlling other aspects than only the magnetic control. For example, now we only control the uh, details of the magnetic field, but in general, for when you want to study plasma performance, you also need to evolve or to have a, a model that evolves the temperature and the density of the core of the pla plasma in particular. And the physics models you need for that are quite more, a bit more, um, uh, more, com more, more complex and more complicated and contain different kinds of physics with respect to the magnetic control that we showed uh, today. So there's a lot more work to be done there, both on the side of the, uh, of the physics understanding and of actual fundamental tokamak plasma science, and also on the computational side, on the machine learning side, to accelerate the models we could use for such studies using computational and machine learning techniques. 
Uh, and finally, one possible uh, future application of this work would be to do so-called co-design, which means to simultaneously optimize the design of a future tokamak fusion reactor while designing the controller and solving the controllability problem at the same time. Um, as to, to just repeat the, the conclusions and the main results of this work, we demonstrated for the first time the application of a reinforcement learning controller for closed loop uh, magnetic control of a tokamak plasma, where the controller was trained entirely in simulation and tested on a real uh, device. Now, both from the reinforcement learning point of view, this is a, 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 a big, big step towards applying reinforcement learning techniques on real world control engineering pro problems. This is one of the most complex or probably the most complex application of reinforcement learning in a real world engineering problem uh, so, so far. And we, one of the things we take away from this is that physics mo models, so all the physics understanding you need to make, high quality models of your systems are required for this kind of approaches to be able to learn from simulations. Um, more, more generally speaking, this also uh, points towards more uh, good and interesting future applications of reinforcement learning, both for accelerating fusion science along the lines, as I said earlier, improving plasma performance and potentially design new devices, and also for applications to more complex real world, world uh, systems, engineering systems, which you want to feedback control using these approaches, in particularly in particular where good models exist. So that brings me to the end of our uh, of our pre presentation and we want to stress again how such a collaboration has really been a multidisciplinary collaboration where we merge physics knowledge physics understanding and simulation abilities with machine learning and reinforcement learning in particular so not only was this a tight integration of these various technologies it also required a very tight integration of the two teams to uh, um, to be able to to achieve this this uh, this this result and bring these two worlds together so with that i th thank you also on behalf of jonas and if we if you have any questions we will be happy to answer them cool thank you so much um, for this very very interesting talk um, so now we move on to the discussion um, part of our seminar any questions from our audience please uh, just unmute and ask or raise your hand <laughs> 